morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're, you're uh, zooming in from. Uh, and as it says on the screen, you will see on the screen, I'm Joe Nellis, a professor of global economy, and therefore today's topic, the global economy, is obviously uh, something that I'm very interested in. Uh, I'm currently uh, dean, deputy dean of the school, although this week uh, the dean is on holidays, so I'm the acting dean, but uh, it will last for just another two days. Uh, but as, as David said, I've been at Cranfield a long time. Uh, it's been my life in many ways. This is now uh, 39 years, so I'm heading for the 40th year very soon, uh, and I'm still enjoying it. And I must say, I I've, was saying earlier to David, I've really enjoyed the online experiences that we've created here at Cranfield, and I think that is the future. Uh, at least it's, it's an option, but it's one of the, the streams of activities that is growing very quickly here. But without further ado, uh, let me start uh, to share with you, well, not only my thoughts, but the thoughts of organizations around the world about the future of the global economy. Uh, it's a huge topic, so I'm, I'm going to be quite brief because I want to leave time for questions. And I'm sure there will be many questions. Uh, th this is something that uh, interests all of us. I, I will only mention the UK in passing. Uh, but of course, if you have a question about the UK or any country, I will try to answer that. And if I can't, I'll pass over to David. He'll, he'll answer the questions, of course. <laughs> uh, so here's a, a wonderful quote, uh, which was, you know, it's a hundred year old quote, which I think is so relevant today. Uh, and, you know, I, I just want you to reflect on this. Prediction is very difficult. In, in my professional career, I've never known prediction to be more difficult, uh, especially if it's about the future. Uh, and this Nobel laureate, uh, Niels Bohr, uh, really did get it spot on then. Uh, and that's my excuse, really, for, for being wrong, uh, because nobody has been right, uh, precisely right, in recent times, given the shocks that have hit the global economy, uh, particularly, well, since the global financial crisis, and of course now since COVID and the Ukraine war. So it's, it's a very unclear and uncertain time we live in, but we've still got to, you know, run our businesses. We've still got to run our lives uh, so all I want to do is share with you some information that hopefully will give you a clearer picture, uh, if not uh, a precisely accurate picture. Uh, this is the latest report from the OECD. You may have picked this up in the press a few weeks ago. Uh, it's an interim report and there'll be some revisions. And I'm not going to go down all of these countries. Uh, the key message that you'll see from the left-hand diagram, which is 2023 forecasts, and you move to the right-hand diagram, the 2020 forecast, is that for most countries, uh, in fact, for all countries, there is a slight improvement. Uh, some countries in particular are going to see a significant recovery next year. And you'll notice at the top of the slide, uh, India. Uh, I often call India the, the, the quiet giant. It's coming along very nicely and very quietly. Uh, and of course, we're, we're about to... Uh, hear reports that India's population will exceed that of uh, China sometime this year, probably in the next few months. I don't know exactly when. Uh, but just look at the bottom of the slide. And this has caused some controversy here in the UK. And uh, the government doesn't like to see these figures. Uh, these are the OECD. And I'm going to show the IMF in a moment. Uh, but this year, the OECD predict that the UK will have a small recession over the year. And now the latest figures from the, the UK uh, Office for National Statistics shows us flatlining. So whether it's going to be zero growth or minus 0.2 or even plus 0.1 is really not a big story. The, the story is uh, we're not growing this year. And next year there will be a small recovery for the UK as well as for all other countries, as you'll see from this slide. Uh, and I say, I just want you to remember that you know, particular point about the UK but I don't want to focus on the UK, I said, and I must stop doing that uh, when we come to the IMF figures. And these are the latest figures from the IMF, just came out last week. Uh, they were widely reported. I've just plucked off some of the, the graphs. And just look at the left-hand side. Uh, the global economy this year is forecast, and it's simply a forecast, not a guarantee, because we hope that governments will do something to avoid this downturn. But at the moment, uh, as we stand here, as, as we sit here, the global economy is predicted to have a downturn this year and perhaps growing below 3%. I want to come back to that later. That's a, a significant point. There'll be a slight recovery next year. 
but the downturn will be more severe in the advanced economies, the G7 countries in particular, and widening to the G20, but particularly the G7 countries, with only a very marginal recovery in 2024. Uh, in my opinion, I think the advanced economies, uh, and some in particular, such as the UK, I think we're gonna go through a, several years of modest growth. Uh, and that has an implica implications for government tax revenues, for government spending plans, uh, and for the general mood in the economy. Look at the right-hand side, however, you'll notice that emerging markets and developing economies, uh, well, yeah, I mean, 3.9% is not great for those economies, but it's still a lot better than the advanced economies, and they will see a recovery uh, perhaps to over 4% in 2024. I wanna come back to that on the next slide and break these big categories down into regional categories. And you'll notice the USA, uh, quite remarkable. It's forecast by the IMF and by most organizations to have a downturn for the next two years. Uh, it, it, there are significant uh, you know, pushes against the USA. Uh, and uh, this may change, I'm hoping it will. I suspect that uh, the president, uh, Joe Biden, will go for a, a bit of a spending splash uh, pre-election uh, in the USA. But based on current information, we're looking at a slowdown in the USA. In the Euro area, you'll see this year is quite bad, 0.8% with a bounce, small bounce back uh, next year. I won't go through all the regions, but I want to look particularly at the right-hand side, uh, emerging and developing Asia. Uh, and this is dominated in particular by China and India, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there will be a, you know, a recovery to over 5% this year uh, forecast, and perhaps a little bit of steam coming out in 2024, but still growing at 5%, uh, which given the global context uh, where we are right now, uh, I think those figures are impressive, uh, despite the fact that they are from a lower baseline, but nevertheless, uh, it does signify, I think, a closing of the gap between emerging and developing Asia and well, the, the advanced economies. I will come back to this later, I promise. Now, uh, the G7 countries uh, get a lot of attention. Uh, and you'll notice, and this is the latest figures from the IMF, which some governments don't like to report these or don't like to refer to them. Uh, the, the IMF, in line with the OECD, by the way, uh, and these are, these are independent, separate organizations. The IMF thinks that the UK will have a, a 0.3 fall this year. Again, uh, whether that turns out to be zero growth, I don't think that is significant. It's gonna be a difficult year uh, for the UK as a whole and for Germany. That's, the Germany the Germany is actually doing relatively well uh, given their energy uh, challenges since they import a lot of gas from, from Russia. I think Germany, yes, a small recession, but marginal. And then of course, Russia uh, forecast to do, well, I won't say relative, I, I won't say well, but relative to uh, Germany and the UK this year, but that's primarily driven by the cost of energy and in particular, the cost of oil. Uh, and the oil prices have been rising lately with the cutback in OPEC product production. And then you again go to the bottom uh, bar chart here and China growing by, uh, forecast to grow by over 5% this year uh, by the IMF. Uh, you know, it, it's quite a, you know, it, this all looks positive in some extent, but look at the, the numbers on the bottom. You know, zero, one, two. So none of the G, uh, the only G7 country above 2% is, is in fact China forecast this year. Uh, well, again, all of this we will discuss in more detail. Here are some more details. I, I've literally screenshotted the IMF report and done some cutting just to highlight some of the major areas of the world. Uh, I'm not gonna linger on these. Uh, you, you can uh, look at these later when we, when we make the slides available. But again, look at the very bottom line. Uh, India, India's forecast to grow next year by 6.3%, the fastest growing country out of the G20 countries. Uh, and I think that's significant. You'll notice the UK forecast will go by 1% next year. And the, you know, the UK government's very keen to, to focus on the growth figures, not on the negative figures. But we've got to take the bad news as well as the good news. But of course, 1% growth is, is really very modest uh, as we head into the next general election at the end or to be, of next year or beginning of 2025. 
Uh, you, will know, you will see the 2022 figures here, by the way, look very good for most countries. But of course, that's the, the bounce back from, from COVID. Uh, we had a significant bounce back in 2021 and 2022. Uh, we had the V-shaped recoveries. Uh, but these bounce backs are now tapering off very, very quickly around the world. Inflation has been a, you know, a massive uh, topic around the world for the last year or so since the Ukraine war. Uh, and there is good news, but I, I want to qualify this. And I, I, do want to, I do want to be optimistic, but let's be realistic. Uh, the, the, in the inflation spikes that we've seen right across the globe, uh, those spikes will diminish in the coming months. Uh, when, when politicians say that they're going to make inflation fall by half this year, that is not a great promise. Inflation is going to fall anyway, uh, because if you, if you double prices last year, and if prices remain where they are this year, inflation falls from 100% to zero. Uh, I mean, statistically, there will be a sharp fall in prices. The question is, when will this begin? We think it's gonna take another month or two uh, across the world. Some countries are already seeing uh, significant falls. So the average in Europe is now, I think about six and a half percent. In the UK, it's still 10.1%, but it's gonna take some more months. I think by July, we're gonna see global inflation, uh, certainly half what it was at the start of this year, uh, unless some other unexpected curveball uh, materializes, which I hope doesn't happen by the way. Uh, but it's very, remember, it's very difficult to predict the future at the moment. But I say that the positive news is there is a very, very strong consensus across you know, all organizations that are involved in economic forecasting that just because of the, you know, the, the peaks have been reached, that we will see a, a natural fall uh, in inflation uh, month by month by month. It is happening already in a number of countries, not necessarily in every country. Uh, and here's, a, here's some of the list of countries, but particular countries. Again, I'm not going to read every one out, uh, but the, the blue charts represent this year's inflation. Uh, the, the white dots, the white diamonds in the middle are the forecast for next year. Uh, and again, you'll see in almost all cases, but not every case, I see Spain is one exception and, and Saudi Arabia another one, uh, but the inflation is coming down generally. I did look at the Turkey figures, by the way, just before we came online. Uh, it is expected that this year, Turkey's inflation could actually fall to about 22%, although at the moment it's actually over 50%. So th there's gonna be some differences here, uh, even from the OECD figures and IMF figures. But general consensus, inflation is on the way down in most parts of the world. I do feel very sorry for people in Argentina. I can also mention Ghana, by the way, inflation has gone crazy in Ghana uh, for particular local reasons there as well. Oh, and I should have mentioned, and I just spotted the, the UK figure there, again, falling perhaps even by more than half, according to the OECD, uh, between this year and next year. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you will know that I'm particularly worried about productivity. Uh, productivity in many, many countries, and here's the, the G20 countries, uh, has actually turned downwards uh, you know, in recent years. And you'll see the average for the 1990 to 1999 uh, period, the, the decade, where productivity was quite strong. Uh, and then the average since 2013, up until the end of 2022, productivity has fallen. You'll see that in most cases. Uh, I think actually in all cases, in fact, as I look at the slide. Uh, and if you look particularly at the UK, and that does concern me, obviously. And can I just stress, Productivity is essential for economic growth. Uh, investing in technology, investing in skills, investing in infrastructure creates the conditions for growth. Investment is the engine of growth. And therefore it is of grave concern to see that productivity in many countries has turned downwards because that suggests that growth in economies will be constrained uh, in the years ahead. Uh, and therefore growth in government tax revenues and growth in government spending plans and growth in living standards. I, I mean, th this is something we should all be concerned about. Uh, how do we increase productivity? Uh, and what is the cause of lower productivity? 
many people are trying to find the answers to these questions. Uh, if you find the answer, let me know quietly because I think it's a Nobel Prize uh, on, in the offing here. <laughs> the, 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 this is one of the biggest topics in the world today, particularly in the advanced economies. Now, in terms of outlook for the global economy, uh, well, I've said already, and you saw the figures, this year the, the world economy is expected to grow by less than 3%. And that will, if, if it happens, and I think it's almost certain, by the way, uh, unless there's some exceptional new developments, uh, this will be the slowest pace of growth since 1990, uh, sadly. Uh, oops, excuse me, I'll just go back to that again. Uh, and the IMF I have used this phrase, and I've just taken the, the, the exact words, uh, in their opinion, the path ahead is, is rough and foggy. <clears throat> it's not very clear as to what's going to happen in the coming year, and even the coming couple of years, I think, are going to be questionable. And sadly, and I, I do mean this, uh, it's sad that cooperation between countries is now coming under a bit of pressure. Uh, a lot more talk about protectionism, uh, a lot more talk, and I'll, you'll see later, about onshoring as opposed to offshoring, Remember, for the last 30 or 40 years, globalization has driven the world economy and has driven many, many countries up from the base of the pyramid and has improved the, 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 the life, the livelihoods of many hundreds of millions of people. Uh, I am concerned that if we have a reversal of globalization, it is bad news for many of the developing countries of the world. As again, I, I will discuss this later. Excuse me a second. And the IMF expects to see a, a wave of uh, requests from many, many developing countries, low-income economies, for help and debt restructuring. It's already happening, by the way. Uh, you know, the, the advanced economies, of course, we've borrowed a lot of, a lot of money. We've raised debt uh, from ourselves, from future generations. We've borrowed around the world. But the low-income low income countries find this more challenging for obvious reasons. They, they are higher risk of default. Uh, and they, like us, like us, like us in the advanced economies, they've also suffered from uh, the COVID-19 crisis and, of course, the, the Ukraine war. And they, too, are facing soaring cost of living crises. Uh, I mentioned Ghana, and I know the inflation rate there is, is very, very high. And yet it's an agricultural-based economy, but food prices have, have escalated dramatically. Uh, so th this is not a, you know, a local problem. This is a global problem. Uh, and said so the IMF is getting ready to, to uh, you know, be impacted by a wave of requests for help. Uh, and, and I think this is, an, this is inevitable. Uh, just a few more thoughts on the outlook for the world economy. Uh, so global growth, as you saw earlier, last year, last year uh, fell back uh, by half from the, remember I said the bounce back? Uh, it, it fell by almost half from the previous year in 2021. Uh, in 2022, I should say, it grew by 3.4%. Uh, and, and this was, again, significant slowdown. And this is going to continue. Uh, th th this bounce back, by the way, was below the average for the last two decades. So, you know, th 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 this means that the future may not look exactly like the past. I mean, reversion to the norm should not be taken for granted. Uh, and it has continued, I've said already. And despite the fact that in many parts of the world, uh, and certainly in the advanced economies, we've seen very strong job markets. We, we've seen labor shortages in many, many sectors. So despite that, uh, you know, the, the bounce back is now moderating significantly. Uh, we expect global growth, I said earlier, to dip below 3% this year, uh, 2023. But I want to say again, I mean, India and China uh, are leading the way, uh, uh, the recovery path, and they're going to account for half of the world economic growth at half of the increase this year, which is remarkable. But 90% of the advanced economies, the so-called G7 economies, 90% uh, are expected to see growth decline uh, this year and into next year, which is quite it's important to note. Uh, now, we're all concerned about the, the cost of borrowing, about short-term interest rates and mortgage rates and, and long-term loans. Uh, we are still going to see uh, you know, interest rates remain where they are in many countries, and I think there's still a bit to go in terms of short-term interest rates in the coming months. I think in the UK, we're going to see at least one more quarter percent rise. I said at least one. I'm trying to hedge my bets. Uh, because inflation is still a problem. 
uh, yes, it's coming down, but until it is, is coming down significantly, central banks are just keeping their foot on the brake. They were criticized for not acting quick enough in many cases. Now they're making sure that inflation doesn't become embedded. They're most concerned about inflation being embedded through wage increases. It's the wage price spiral uh, that is, is talked a lot about here in the UK, for example. Now, I'm just going to give a little bit of a, an, an MBA type lecture. Uh, here's a graph going back to a very long way, by the way, to about 1870. Uh, it's straight from the IMF. Uh, and, and they've given the sources of, of, of their own, but it's from the IMF report based on information from the World Bank and the Penn World Data Bank, etc., etc. Uh, if you just look very, very quickly in the industrialization era, uh, trade, and by the way, here globalization is defined as uh, the value of exports plus the value of imports as a percentage of global GDP. So it's the proportion of global GDP accounted for by total trade, exports plus imports. And you'll see it rising in the industrial industrial area uh, era, and you'll see it falling, not surprisingly, because of uh, the wars and protectionism in the interwar years and then during the Second World War, not surprising. And then we come to the fixed exchange rate era, the birth of the IMF based on the Bretton Woods system. Uh, and you'll see that the, the beginning of a long-term growth in world trade and globalization. And then we had the, the era after 1980 of liberalization, with the opening up of economies, opening up of China especially, and world trade surged. And then look at the right-hand side. I'm going to come back to these in a moment with more detail. And you'll see that growth of globalization leveling off. Uh, and my concern is it might actually be turning down in some cases. Too early to say yet. Uh, I think we need to keep an eye on this. And I, I think it's an unfortunate development if we do see a downturn because globalization has, I said earlier, helped hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Now, let me give a bit more detail around each of those. So that first era, the industrialization era, I, I'm not going to linger on it, uh, but the countries that really benefited from global trade then were Argentina and Canada and Europe and the USA, of course, So I'm, and the UK is part of this. Uh, the, the gold standard then was actually a, a sterling gold standard. Uh, and the big developments, particularly in the mass production of cars, uh, drove, you know, drove forward uh, the global economy, lowering trade costs and boosting trade volumes. Remember, 1908 was the, the year that the, the, the Henry Model T Ford was, was launched. And, and within 25 years, you know, half of Americans had a Model T Ford car, replacing the horse and cart, actually. Uh, but it, it swept across the world uh, and, and led to uh, the beginning of a, you know, a a period of expansion in, in globalization. But then along comes, excuse me again, my, my fault. Uh, and then along comes the interwar era. Uh, and we, not surprisingly, saw a dramatic reversal of globalization uh, and the rise of protectionism, which, which was, you know, totally uh, <laughs> understandable. Uh, and trade became regionalized amongst the, 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 the allies are the countries that were closely aligned with each other around the world. And, and the, the gold standard broke down, collapsed uh, into currency blocks. Uh, but of course, the, the interwar period, uh, you know, ended uh, and the Second World War ended. And then we come to the big era of the beginning of globalization as, as a massive driver of the world economy. And the USA emerging as, not surprising, the dominant superpower. And of course, the, the, the Bretton Woods Agreement, they, they had to find something to peg, uh, you know, to use as, the, as the, the basis for trade. And the dollar was chosen and pegged to the gold. And hence it became a, not a new gold standard. Uh, but again, the dollar pegged to gold at $35 a troy ounce. I won't go into a full lecture here, by the way, so relax. Uh, but trade, trade liberalization spurred expansion across the globe, particularly in Europe and Japan. And, and Japan surged in terms of economic growth and many developing economies, therefore. Uh, but the gold standard, the, 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 the IMF gold standard, the, the, the Bretton Woods system collapsed uh, around about 1971 uh, because the US were printing dollars. They, they went for a massive expansion uh, of dollars uh, quietly because they were supposed to be locked into gold uh, and it collapsed. Uh, and then many countries switched to floating exchange rates uh, and the rest is history uh, after that. Uh, we then had that sharp increase in liberalization that I talked about earlier, 
Uh, and this is when we saw the removal of many trade barriers ac across the world uh, and China beginning to open up uh, and other large emerging markets opening up and moving out in, into the global economy. Uh, unprecedented economic cooperation across the world. Uh, and, and there were some difficulties in getting trade deals. You know, the, the, the GATT uh, talks had ended in 1984. Uh, it took a long time to get an agreement, but then that gave birth to the World Trade, or Trade Organization. Uh, and then capital flows surged. So it wasn't just uh, goods and services, it was also capital and technology. Technology transfer opened up. Uh, and we had a massive period of global economic and financial integration. One of my special research areas when I was a young academic was exactly this topic, but I won't bore you with that too much. And then we now enter into what the IMF are calling uh, the, the slobalization era. Uh, they're not saying a collapse yet in globalization, but the growth of globalization is slowing down significantly. Uh, and the pace of trade reforms has really begun since the global financial crisis. And a number of governments, a number of uh, countries around the world are beginning to question whether or not uh, they would like to continue with globalization at the same pace because there are a number of political tensions. Uh, we, we've seen that uh, in, in the Trump era, uh, you know, and, and we also hear it today, uh, you know, let's make America great again. It, it's, and I don't just mean USA, it, it's, it's a global issue. And then I want to just raise this as a question mark. Are we beginning to see the, the, the ending of offshoring, which has been a dominant trend in the last 20, 30 years? And are we seeing the beginning of onshoring? Or will it, and I'm sure it'll be a balance of both, by the way. Uh, what are the implications of that? There are a number of risks lying ahead for the global economy as I head towards the end of my of slides, just to try and give you plenty of time for questions. Uh, I think there is a concern that, you know, I, I've talked about inflation coming down. Uh, it will come down, that's for sure but it doesn't mean we're gonna go back to where it was a couple of years ago before COVID. I think there will still be a, a residual inflationary pressure in the system uh, globally. Uh, a, a lot of organizations, I think, you know, are putting prices up because they can. I, I'm not suggesting they're uh, necessarily uh, being greedy, but I, I'm not gonna comment on any in particular, but I think that there has been a, a, a rush to catch up on uh, price rises, which didn't happen before COVID. Uh, so I think there's a danger that some of these inflationary pressures will remain, but we still will see lower inflation. Uh, one of my biggest concerns, and it, it applies to so many countries, but in particular, the low income economies, uh, is the growing indebtedness. It's everywhere, uh, it's absolutely everywhere, but I'm particularly concerned about the debt buildup in the, the, the poorest countries of the world who can least afford it. And much of their debt, of course, is in dollars and therefore they're exposed to currency risk. This has happened before, many years ago. Uh, and, and of course, there is a, a, a huge danger here of ever increasing income inequalities. That's happening across the world, in rich countries and in poor countries, between countries and within countries. Uh, and you know, in Africa, they've got a saying, which I think we should all remember. A hungry man is an angry man. And, and we should be concerned about that and be concerned about people who are facing these problems, uh, cost of living crises. I said earlier, and I want to repeat it again, I think the advanced economies are in danger of, maybe the word danger is the wrong word, but I think we should be realistic and appreciate we may be, we may be heading into a, a long period of slower economic growth. That's not a bad thing, by the way. I mean, we have to adjust to uh, the environmental challenges. We're gonna have to you know, move away from, we must move away from fossil fuels. And all of this will create you know, some burdens for economies. Uh, I do not see a, a sudden growth uh, surge, a uh, uh, booming economies that will take care of our debt problems and uh, tax revenues will rise and will fund the you know, electric vehicles. I don't see that happening for a number of years. Uh, in fact, uh, beyond my sort of uh, you know, realm of forecasting. Uh, and we have a, a period, of course, of, uh, we've had a period of asset bubble inflation. Quantitative easing has, and, and you'll all know this, by the way, across the world, property prices have gone up sharply. Uh, during COVID uh, in, the, in recent years, uh, bond prices have, have surged and the stock markets have done exceptionally well in general. Uh, but as John Maynard you know, questioned, what happens to all bubbles eventually? And we know what happens eventually. Uh, the, the, this, this pumping up of asset prices cannot be sustained. Uh, and, and a number of countries, a number of central banks are now starting to talk about uh, reversing quantitative easing 
and quantitative tightening is now the phrase. Uh, the UK started it sm on a small scale on November the 1st last year, just to test the waters. But you, you should all know what has happened now to bond yields in the last 12 months. They've gone from a record low and they've now gone up in the world. And, and that's the cost of borrowing, the long-term cost of borrowing, uh, the, the cost of fixed rate mortgages. Uh, and I think this is a, is a danger that uh, assets prices uh, may start to fall even more. I, I'm not going to predict a collapse, by the way, so relax. Uh, I want to come to this particular point. What, what I've called, and I've used this phrase in previous presentations, uh, but I want to come back to it again. The changing spheres of influence. And let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, you know, throughout my lifetime, throughout your lifetime, the USA has been and will be a major sphere of influence. No question about that. And the countries aligned with the USA uh, are being pulled along in, in that uh, sphere of influence. I don't think the former president, Donald Trump, helped the US sphere of influence on a global scale. I think uh, it, it, he, he began to talk about more protectionist type policies, making America great again. Uh, and I'm not sure if the current president, Joe Biden, has done much to reverse that impression. Uh, and then the EU is, is a major sphere of influence in population terms, bigger than the USA, economic terms, very similar. Uh, but Brexit hasn't helped the EU. And I'm not going to go into that in detail. Uh, but the EU's influence has been diminished by Brexit. And the EU itself is having a lot of problems. Uh, you know, it's, it's the northern European countries are much stronger than the southern European countries. Uh, and that is a dilemma for the EU. I absolutely hope the EU becomes stronger and more integrated because we need a, a balance in the balance of power. But the point I want to emphasize here is, is what I've made, mentioned before in previous presentations is the, 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 the rapid expansion in the sphere of influence of China. And I put Russia in brackets. I'm not sure where that's going to play out, how it's going to play out. But China's influence is and will expand significantly, particularly during and after the COVID crises. Uh, no doubt about that. China is pumping millions, millions of vaccines into Africa free of charge. It is investing even more, more funds into Africa. It's accelerated the investment. It, it's, it's loans to African countries have increased significantly. Uh, and I think this is very smart. I, I congratulate China for their, their long-term planning. Uh, we certainly uh, could learn a lot from that type of mentality, by the way. Uh, and this, this is changing the balance of power even faster than we could have imagined before COVID. And of course, I think most importantly, I think what China is doing is, is creating longer term trade relationships that aren't dependent on advanced economies. Uh, I want to stress that. Uh, this is a, I, th I think it's part of a very smart long term plan. Uh, I, I often describe this strategy of China, if I'm correct, by the way, in my interpretation, I often describe it as modern colonialization, as opposed to the old form of colonialization. I think China is investing heavily to embed itself into economies, and that will lead to longer term trade relationships. But again, that's not a criticism. Uh, that is my interpretation of what I see happening. And I think it's a very smart strategic move. And I think the consequence is, we are seeing in real time, in my opinion, uh, and I mean real time now, we're seeing a realignment of, of nations around the world, uh, aligned around the USA and Europe, let's call them the Western or the advanced economies, and then the rest of the world aligned around China, perhaps Russia and India and Pakistan, many African countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia uh, Iran. I, I think it's a realignment taking place before our very eyes at a pace we could not have imagined. It's taken decades, decades for the, the current positioning of, of the, the superpowers. Well, I think we're seeing changes now at a pace. So looking ahead, uh, a lot of organizations are trying to, to guess what the world will look like in 2050. I'm, I'm just gonna give you some thoughts that I've picked up from various uh, sources. Uh, but there's no doubt that the world is still gonna grow, by the way, despite the slowdown uh, that I've talked about earlier, you know, even if it grows to 3%, it's still going to double uh, in, in the next, you know, 25 to 30 years. And technology is the driver here. Remember, investment's the engine of growth, and technology is at the forefront of this. The robots are coming. 
the AI, the expansion of that uh, right across the globe. Uh, and many, many countries uh, that are able to leapfrog technology are going to benefit from this. Uh, the, the legacy systems don't exist if you don't have them. But if you can embrace the latest technology from the USA, from Europe, from China, then it gives countries the potential to, to surge up the growth ladder. And so here, here's, for what it's worth, here are the, some predictions uh, of what the world will look like in 2050. I think there's no doubt China will be the biggest economy long before 2050, and India will be up, up there as well. USA will still be in the top five. It's a huge economy. And Indonesia is getting a lot of attention. It's one of the so-called mint economies in Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey, uh, the, the new emerging markets that are showing tremendous energy uh, of growth. And I think Brazil, despite all of its problems in recent years, and they've now got a new president, I think the potential is still there for Brazil to become one of the, the, the true, you know, major economies of the world because of its, of its size, its resources, its people. And I hope they achieve it. But they haven't done very well in recent years, but I hope they achieve it. And then the next five, you may be surprised to see Russia there. I'll come back to that in a moment. I think so much depends on the Ukraine war. Mexico, again, one of the mint economies. And then the, the, the old guys on the block, the old countries on the block, Japan, Germany, UK, but still in the top 10, hopefully. Uh, there's, no, there's no guarantee of this, by the way. But my last point on this is, you know, I, I can't yet imagine what the impact <laughs> of a long-term Ukraine war will be on some of these countries. Uh, it certainly uh, is, is impacting Russia, of course, and impacting Germany and the UK and many other countries. Uh, but that is to be seen. Let, let, let's hope it doesn't go on much longer. And so, finish off. Uh, and I want, I'm, set, I'm going to leave plenty of time, 20 minutes for, for conversations with, with you. Uh, future of the global economy, what are some of the big challenges? Well, I've already mentioned some. Let me just I mention some others. I think we're still learning how to adapt to the impact of the pandemic. Uh, the, the, the whole hybrid working concept across the globe, as well as the, the, the consequence for mental health, uh, that is something that we now thankfully do talk about and hopefully we're helping people to cope with this uh, but you know it's not going to go away any day soon and of course the ongoing health sector costs globally uh, not just UK by the way but across the world the backlog in health services across the world and what does normal look like uh, you know what is the normal uh, is hybrid now the permanent new normal I think it is for many 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 countries for many many companies uh, it's going to be very difficult to go back to what it was like before COVID. Uh, and then the, the, the scale of debt that I mentioned earlier, uh, government debt in low-income economies as well as advanced economies, uh, we're going to be passing, the, the world is going to be passing on debt to the next generations for a very long time. And then global recession for some countries, uh, but, you know, very mild. I, I probably should call that growth recession. Growth recession is a phrase that Paul Krugman coined uh, during the global financial crisis. In other words, many countries growing below trend, but still growing. So growth recession will be a much better word here. So I must correct that. And inflation will still be a problem, but much less of a problem. And interest rates, still a bit more to go, I'm afraid. But I think we're near the peak. But I don't think they're going to come down sharply either. So uh, that, that's my view of where we, we head in the next few years. And then, of course, I've just alluded to this, I think we're going to adapt, have to adapt to a new world order, whatever that may look like. So on that note, folks, I hope I didn't rush through that too quickly, but I did want to leave plenty of time for your questions, and David's going to help with this, of course. And therefore, thank you very much indeed. David, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, as always, uh, yeah. Joe. A fascinating insight to uh, the background uh, for what's happening today and into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll have a quick look at this. Please remember, um, oops, that's because uh, I pressed the wrong button. That's better. Um, many thanks for him. Yeah, joining us here about Joe's thoughts. Um, if you do have any questions or comments for Joe's, please chat them now. Uh, we've received lots of questions. We've got about uh, 17 minutes or so uh, of Q&A. Uh, so chat your questions. We will answer as many as we can. So uh, let me just... Uh, let me just resize my chat. I hope box. you can see them all, by the way. Yes, no, I can resize <laughs> my chat box. It's just be able to, got to be able to see what the hell's uh, be able you. to see them. So yeah, it's just picking the questions out from amongst uh, these. Um, there's, there's an interesting one from actually from Richard Harris. 
Um, how much credence do you give to OECD IMF announcements forecasts on GDP? Yeah. He says, are they not a bit lagged? You know, e.g., you know, there's a delay and a bit national, i.e., biased uh, estimates. Good question, and I totally understand the sentiment behind it. Uh, do I trust anybody's forecasts? No, I don't. Do I trust our own government's forecasts? No, I don't. Uh, I do trust more the independent forecasts from the Office for National Statistics, or oh, they don't make forecasts, by the way. They produce the data, they don't produce the forecasts. Uh, I think politicians tend to, to create their own forecasts. Uh, I think if the OECD and IMF were predicting great news for economies, we'd all be saying, wow, this is wonderful. We, we would, we would uh, give it credit uh, and, and they'd be credible. So do I trust them? I think it's important to, to be cynical at all times about data. I absolutely accept that. But I do stress that the OECD and the IMF are independent organizations. These are not driven by individual governments. And it's for that reason that I give them more credibility than many other sources, but they are global. Uh, is there a time lag? Yes, there is. That, that's true for all data. Even here in the UK, our GDP estimates only come out about six weeks after the end of the quarter, and then they're revised for several quarters after that. So that's an inevitable fact of life regarding this scale of data. But I don't think you should look at the, the, the individual numbers as such. Look at the general pattern, the general trend. That's what I would focus on all the time. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you, Joe. Yes. Uh, so I see. So yeah, you do trust them, though that you have a general um, sort but, of but, uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, take it with a pinch of salt of or see what's happening. Um, carrying on the thing about the IMF, uh, IMF has a positive outlook for most of year 2024. Yeah. Uh, what would your take be on continued war in Ukraine and any potential conflict in the Far East for global economics? Yes, and I, and I know what that question suggests. Uh, th th there's the, I shouldn't use the word curveball, but there's the unknown. Uh, if anybody knows when the war is going to end, please let us all know, because that, that, that is the big question mark here. A continuation of the Ukraine war, uh, and I won't say for how long, because I, I don't want to make a prediction about that, is, is not good news for the world economy. Uh, food prices could remain high and, and inflation could be sustained, therefore, at a higher level than we expect. Uh, it is a grave concern. Uh, part of your question talked about the Far East, and, and I, I know precisely what you're referring to. Uh, I almost don't want to say this, but what if China decides to walk into Taiwan? Uh, that's beyond my pay grade. Uh, I, I think we can all imagine uh, what could happen uh, in my, and I'm not a geopolitical expert at all. Uh, if China were to do that, uh, it's a game changer. Uh, I don't think the USA will retaliate because we all know what the consequence of that is. So I'm, I'm going to leave that to the side. I think that's, a, that's a, we're, we're all going to keep our fingers crossed and hope that some common sense prevails. Uh, the sooner this war in Ukraine ends, the better. Uh, I do think China, again, I respect China. I think they are cleverly keeping quiet to see what happens. And I think strategically that is, that is very, very smart indeed. Yeah, I know, Joe, you have a, 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 this thing about their strategic foresight or their certainly yeah. long view. I mean, uh, that, that's quite an interesting yeah. uh, point of view. Quiet, yes, strategically quiet, did you say? I oh, no, no, I think they're quiet regarding the All Ukraine right. war. Yeah. I think they're not quiet. I think their strategy for... Uh, trade relationships is very obvious that they are investing in growth, but investing in countries for growth. And, you know, we did it for a very long time, but many countries are, uh, well, in the UK's case, we're cutting back on our development uh, aid programs. And I think that's, that's going to come back to haunt us uh, at a later date. Because you, you did talk about a new form of colonization, sorry, colonialism. Well, that's right. I, <laughs> I call China's strategy modern, modern, uh, colonialization. I think it's, it's a very smart strategy of investing in the future. Well, let's uh, take a, a jump and actually have a look uh, at some questions about the BRIC countries. Um, seen this in the news myself recently, uh, BRICS countries anticipated new currency. How do you think that will affect the global economy? And do you think it will actually happen? Uh, well, the reason for it is, uh, and uh, the earlier slide actually uh, give a, a little hint, since the Second World War, we have been uh, dependent, we have been hooked on the dollar. Uh, and now let me focus on that. Let me be very polite here. Uh, 
world reliance on the dollar helps one country in particular. You can guess which country it is, uh, the USA. But the rest of us then have to cope with transaction costs, uh, with do dollar volatility, uh, and particularly uh, developing economies, low-income economies, who, who borrow in dollars, have to pay back in dollars, but they, they have to earn dollars. And that may be very difficult in times of global slowdowns. So I think the over-reliance, that may sound rather mm, impolite, the reliance on the dollar has benefits for the USA, but costs for many other countries. In particular, by the way, for China. China is the biggest holder of dollars in the world as a reserve currency. They've got more dollars than any other country, because and they've earned these dollars. But if the dollar were to fall sharply in, val in purchasing terms, it were to f fall in value, China will, will lose a fortune. So clearly the, there's, there's talk now about, well, can we move away from reliance on the dollar to other currencies? Now, the BRIC economies, uh, well, I mean, they're, they're nothing special about BRIC. I think a lot of the talk is about what about the euro becoming, you know, a rival to the dollar as a reserve currency in terms of oil and commodities. But more importantly, what about the Chinese currency becoming a global currency? The renminbi uh, is not a convertible currency. It, it's, it's only within China. Uh, and given that China is a major trading, uh, you know, country in the world, I think China is going to come under more and more pressure to let its currency be convertible and to float. Uh, and, and it's inevitable that when that, if and when that does happen, the renminbi will rise in value and that will take some of the edge off China's competitiveness. So I think this is possible, but I don't think it's likely just yet. If I were China, I would delay, 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 delay for as long as possible and take advantage of the fact that their currency is not convertible until they become such a powerful trading nation, and they already are, by the way, but I mean to expand their influence, then I think there'll be pressure to trade in renminbi. So I think that, yes, the BRIC economies are talking about this and many other economies are talking about it. I think it's some way off yet, some way off yet. OK, thank you, Joe. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody, actually, for some of the kind comments uh, about uh, Joe. Uh, we, thank we, you. We, it's very yeah, kind. We dust him off and bring him out once yeah, every now and then. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the kind <laughs> words about Joe and his presentation and for the actual broadcast itself. So thank you very much. Um, so, Joe, uh, to what extent are energy prices uh, determining the economic winners and losers at the moment? Absolutely. Well, that, that's a that's a rhetorical question. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, the, you saw the figures for, for Russia's growth this year. Uh, Russia's recovering financially because of the revenue that's coming in from uh, their ever energy. Now, gas prices have come down. They're now below the peak uh, be, uh, when the war broke out. But oil prices are going back up again. Uh, the OPEC countries just a week or so ago have uh, agreed collectively to reduce the output of oil in order to maintain higher uh, barrel price for oil. Uh, so I think there's no doubt about this. The, the energy is the number one uh, topic at the moment. But let me take an optimistic view of this. Surely this is now the time when we, we must be accelerating our shift away from fossil fuels. I mean, uh, I, I know it's expensive. I, I know there are problems with capacities of batteries and so on. I, I absolutely get that. Uh, but I think we need to accelerate our movement towards uh, net zero carbon uh, because we cannot rely on fossil fuel fuels indefinitely. Uh, Germany, I think it was, was it last week or this week, they've set a marker in the ground and I think it, we, we should all uh, remember this. Uh, by 2035, they, they have set a marker that they will become 100% reliant on renewable energy. I think that's, that's an incredible statement. It's going to be very difficult. Nobody's saying they're going to achieve it in exactly that year, but I think they have stated their, their direction of travel. And I, I wish, I hope that other countries do the same. Uh, the, the, the fossil fuel issue is not just about revenue to Russia or to Saudi Arabia. It's also about the planet. And to hear even this morning about the, the acceleration in, in the, 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 water, the water levels as a result of uh, you know, Arctic and Antarctica beginning to melt at a faster rate. That's a worrying statement uh, this morning. So I, I hope that, uh, that the energy prices that we're seeing are actually a game changer. OK, yes, because uh, they say the news coming from Germany uh, also about the removal of nuclear power and the stopping of uh, oil and gas boilers in houses. Yep. 
Yeah, it, it, it must have an impact, but that's quite interesting. Time is running right? out. Time is running out. And I, I, I'm not a gloom and doom person, by the way, but I think I'm, I'm realistic. I think th this is now the time period when we've got to make a difference. Uh, we can no longer go on talking about it. We've got to do something. And so if the energy crisis is a catalyst to make us change faster, that's, that's good. There's a positive message there. Thank okay. you, um, There was a, a question from Robin uh, Feith. Uh, uh, do you see the drive to net zero as a genuine, genuinely a global commitment and as mm -hmm. a driver for or drag on economic growth? Net growth? Now, there was a comment, actually, yep. a follow-up comment by Andrew, which actually said, if we pay lip service, it's undoubtedly going to be a drag. But yep. what's your thoughts? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Uh, and let me put that in a bit of context. Uh, well, I'll try and put it in context. I think the drive to net zero, uh, being led by the, shall we say, the richest countries in the world, because we can afford to discuss these and to, to put in place the investment. So that, you know, and we should be doing that, absolutely, including China, of course. The problem is a great part of the world's population lives you know, uh, below the poverty line. There, there are poor countries. And for them to, to create this shift is incredibly expensive and almost impossible. If you go to remote villages in Africa uh, and say to them, you should have solar panels, you should have electric vehicles. Well, it just isn't going to happen. Kerosene lamps, charcoal, etc., are still going to be the dominant fuel for them and source of light, sadly. Now, therefore, th there, is, there is a problem. I think the move to net zero, which has to happen faster and faster, is going to cause a drag uh, on a number of countries. Uh, but at the same time, we're going to have to help. We must help the rest of the world to get on board with this as well. Uh, and the good news is, that, you know, when, when these changes start to take place, they will start to accelerate. You know, the, the pace will pick up uh, as we start to get more charging points and more batteries are, and more hydro, hydrogen energy and et cetera, et cetera. Once we start doing this, it will pick up momentum. That's the key point. Uh, but it does, it is going to require, I think, global cooperation at a time when many countries are going in the opposite direction. So. Am I optimistic? I'm, on this score, I'm not actually optimistic, but I want to be. Uh, and I just hope that we, we, we make it happen. Uh, but it is going to be a drag, no doubt about that. But that's true for any technological revolution. We may have to take two steps back, but then we take the three steps forward. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. I, I think it's time for two more questions. Typically, there's so many questions coming in. I've actually lost the last two questions because okay. uh, we've got about four minutes. So it's going to be two short um, Oh, that's if I can find it. Typically, there's so many, we've lost it. Uh, so let's just find where we were. Okay, um, don't worry. Um, Gar uh, the question was, um, Ghana is about to enter into another, because you're close to Ghana, yeah. IMF $3 billion, progr billion dollar program. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, considering the country, the challenges the country is facing, um, what advice do you have for Ghana as they prepare for this IMF program? Wow. Well, the sad thing is... <laughs> it's only two minutes, so yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I won't say much about it because uh, it's so close to my heart. I don't want to uh, let yeah. too much. But Ghana has been there before. Uh, th this is not new. Uh, here we go again. And, and I'll be very cautious what I say, but the political stability is a major crisis, a major problem in Ghana, as it is in many parts of the world, by the way. Uh, and... You know, if they embrace this three billion dollar loan, it is going to saddle them with debt, and they're going to have to export more and more to earn dollars to pay that debt. Uh, and I just hope they do it. But I, as I say, I'm, I'm being very cautious of what I say. Uh, I, I think it's it's a serious problem in Ghana right now. Inflation is is really uh, a crisis for many many people, uh, in, in right across Ghana. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine. I'll be back there later this year, I hope. I was there just a few months ago. And uh, yeah, pe people are struggling. People are struggling. But I'm not going to say more about a particular okay, country. No, well, thank you. It was just interesting thoughts. Yeah. I know it's close to your heart, yeah, so yeah. it would be interesting to see what you thought. So thank you. Um, I think this will be the last question. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, your massive participation. This is undoubtedly the most, num most numbers of questions I've seen uh, recently in one of these uh, sessions. So thank you very much. Uh, final question about China in that case. Uh, China's economic growth seems to have uh, always relied on the real estate industry. Uh, I saw a comment earlier on that saying that uh, China has something like 100,000 empty homes okay, in, in one area. Um, 
yeah, it's led to high housing prices in China. Do you think this will pose an uncertain, uh, uncertain risk to China's economic development in the future, uh, just like the Japanese real estate bubble burst beforehand? Great question, uh, and, and one that is very, very topical. So whoever asked that, thank you very much. But I wouldn't be worrying too much about China. Uh, to compare China with Japan is, 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 is two ends of the spectrum, because Japan had a house price crash, 1989 was the crash, and, and then in years after that, average house, average apartment prices fell by 75% in Tokyo. Uh, even if it happens in China, it will not have the same effect on the Chinese economy. And the reason being, it's a one government economy. Uh, you know, when, when the going gets tough, the Chinese government, they will get going. Uh, and, and China, you know, is well aware of these issues, by the way. They, they, they know uh, they've had a, a property boom and, and they, they've inflated, you know, they, the amount of money that's been pumped in has caused this property price inflation. And yes, I'm aware of the empty properties. Uh, and, and they've simply grown too fast, too quickly. Uh, but they, they know that. Uh, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't be, I'd be less concerned about China, actually. Uh, remember, the Chinese mentality is long term. Uh, 100 year plans, it's a cliche, but 100 year plans uh, it represents that thinking. Uh, so their strategy uh, is, is, of course, to make sure that the economy in China remains strong uh, and, and invests and they're investing for the future and then spreading their, their influence, influence around the world for long term trade relationships. Uh, I, I still see China, as, as the graph earlier showed, they will be number one economy. I, I think that they, they, they want to hold on to their you know, th their current system. Uh, and provided the people of China see the benefits of the system, they'll be happy. But I, I, as I say, I, I, I'm less worried about China than I am about many other countries, I must admit. On that note, I'm, I know David's gonna close this off. Can I just thank you all, by the way, for being online. It's, it's wonderful uh, to share with you my thoughts and to get your questions. And I hope you all stay safe. Thank you so much. David, over to you. So thank you very much, Joe, as usual. And many thanks uh, from everybody saying what a wonderful lecture. Nice to see you again. So, th so that's wonderful. So uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, the next sec session, we, we have the, um, an, uh, the next event, the future of de-shopping. So we're looking at uh, mm. de-shopping, I believe is the trend of buying something for, uh, from a shop and then taking it back after you've worn it once for a, a major <laughs> event or a date or wherever you're going. So uh, that's no problem. But all it leaves me just to say thank you very much for joining us here at Cranfield University. We've enjoyed uh, hearing your comments and, uh, and receiving your questions and certainly enjoyed uh, listening to Joe's answers. Thank you very much. And wherever you are in your day, wherever you are in the world, okay, uh, take care and we'll see you again soon. So thank you very much.